Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Research Roundtable. My name is Kyle King. It's good to be back. Um, if you watch the show often, I wasn't here last time. I got a fever right before um, the live stream, and John had to do it solo. But uh, over the over the years, I've I've grown to trust him like a little bit. So I was kind of okay with it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Thanks, it's, it's, what? Thanks. <laughs> um, it's good to be back. Uh, as always, I'm Kyle. I'm a junior at Yale studying neuroscience. Um, and I'm really interested in OCD, not only because I think it's just a fascinating disorder with a lot of different interesting presentations like we'll cover today, um, but also I have it. So the research surrounding it is something that's really relevant to me. Um, and I'm joined by my co-host, John Abramowitz. John, if you want to say something about yourself. Sure. I'm a professor at the University of North Carolina, and my career has been dedicated to understanding OCD, doing research on it, and testing treatments, and working with folks, and um, helping them when they have OCD. I also find it a fascinating um, phenomenon to understand and help folks with, um, and, I, and I love what I do. And I, as always, enjoy these monthly, we've been doing this for a year and a half now, Kyle. Yeah, a year and a half. Yeah. So it's been great to meet Kyle and to get to see some of my friends like Amy and Nick here, which I assume we're going to get to them next. So back to you, Kyle. <laughs> um, well, not quite yet, actually. Uh, so we do have Amy and Nick here who are two experts on our topic today, Real Event OCD. Um, and I have some questions about it. I know John has some questions about it. But I also wanted to uh, let everyone know that we want to hear your questions, too. Um, this is your time to ask two experts on this topic your questions about real event OCD. Um, so please put your questions in the comments section and um, we'll try to get to them. And also, before we, I introduce our guests, I do have a couple announcements that I need to make. Um, first, this live stream is educational and is not intended to replace therapy. For treatment related questions, please work with your provider or contact a local clinician. You can use the IOCDF's online resource directory at iocdf.org slash find help to locate a trained clinician near you. The International OCD Foundation is not a crisis hotline. If you're in a crisis or if you're ever feeling suicidal or unsafe, please go to your local emergency room or call 911 or the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline by dialing 988. Also, um, a note about the comments section, we want this to be a safe place where you can ask your questions to experts um, yeah, so please feel free to put whatever you want in the comment section, uh, but be respectful of others. Make sure that there's no shame or nothing like that. Um, everything that you put in there will live online forever. So just be mindful of that. Okay, I think that's all I had to say. John, is there anything you want to add? That's the usual stuff. Yeah, I think you, I think you got it. I got it down pat now. Um, okay, so then I'll move on to introducing the interesting people. <laughs> 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 um, let's see. So today we have two guests. I'll start with my first bio is Nick. So I'll start with Nick. Um, Nick is a licensed clinical psychologist and a clinical director at NoCD um, or NOCD. How do you guys prefer to pronounce it? NoCD. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The, the the blending of the two terms, no OCD, no CD. <laughs> it makes more sense than NOCD. <laughs> Um, where he provides clinical leadership and direction for teletherapy services. He's a recognized expert in researching and treating OCD and other related conditions. He's published numerous scholarly works, including peer-reviewed peer -reviewed journal articles, book chapters, and books, and he frequently gives presentations at international conferences on maximizing the effectiveness of treatment for OCD and related conditions. He also has a wealth of experience designing and overseeing several successful training programs that have enhanced the dissemination of evidence-based treatment for OCD, Nick, welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, Kyle. I uh, want to say thank you to you and to John for uh, inviting me to be a part of this. This is uh, something I've been excited about since I received the invitation. Uh, and as always, thank you to the IOCDF for facilitating these uh, great educational discussions. Yeah, thank you for agreeing to join. Um, yeah. This is a topic that has not gotten a lot of attention and I think warrants more attention. Absolutely. Um, our second panelist is Dr. Amy Mariaskin. Is that good? Mariaskin, like Mary asking a question. Mary asking. <laughs> Mary asking. Um, she's a licensed clinical psychologist and founding director of the Nashville OCD and Anxiety Treatment Center. 
She works with individuals with OCD, anxiety, and OC spectrum disorders across the lifespan, providing both individual and group treatment. She is passionate about working with children, families, and couples, as well as serving individuals in the LGBTQ plus community. Dr. Mary Askin is the author of book, the book Thriving Relationships with OCD, published in 2022, which my mom actually has. Um, additionally, she is active in training and serves as faculty for the International OCD Foundation's BTTI and as adjunct faculty for Vanderbilt University. Rhea, how are you? Or Amy, how are you? I'm doing well, and I'm really glad to be here. Thanks for having me. A little uh, known fact is that I was on Amy's dissertation committee. She was a student at Duke, and I was faculty at UNC. Was that like 06, 07, something like that? I, it, you know, I've tried to block out grad school. I believe it was 08. <laughs> oh, oh, wait. Okay. It was an awesome dissertation. I remember that. It was, it was right when I moved to Chapel Hill. Yeah, we decided to put our differences aside as Duke and UNC and <laughs> for, the, for the good of OCD research. For the good of OCD <laughs> research. Academically, I love Duke. They're awesome. But when it comes to basketball, then we have uh, we have some rivalry going on. I mean, there. you you guys both have nothing on Miami. Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to start this one off a little differently than I normally do. Um, normally, I'll give the first question to the panelists. But, John, I wanted to direct my first question to you. Um, because sure. you brought this topic um, up in one of our planning meetings about a, a couple months ago. Um, yeah. And I wanted to know why you thought Real Event OCD was something we should be discussing. Yeah. So I have seen more and more over the you know years, more and more folks kind of calling, asking, you know, I'd like to make an appointment, consultation, whatever. And, uh, you know, my first question is usually, well, tell me about the OCD symptoms you're having, the obsessions and compulsions. And uh, people started saying, well, I, I have real event OCD. Uh, do you know what that is? And my response was, no, uh, I, I don't. Um, and I had to go, uh, you know, to the also to the literature we were talking before. And Nick was saying, you know, he was going to the research literature and found that there was zilch on real event OCD. I actually found an article by Nick, not in the research literature, but in the popular literature. And that's why, you know, and Nick and I have known each other for a long time. Um, but that's that's how, you know, I kind of thought hey, Nick would be a per perfect person to have on the, on, on the show. Um, but I, I didn't know what it was. And, and I'm still not exactly clear just because there's not a lot out there. And um, we have all these different, you know, terms for different types of OCD. So I'm looking forward to learning a lot from Nick and, and Amy um, uh, about this this uh, kind of OCD, I guess. So I guess part of it is is selfish. I want to learn. I'm never <laughs> I'm never done learning. I love learning about OCD or anything really. Oh, well, then this is a good segue. Nick and Amy, what is real event OCD? What can you teach John? Yeah, I can go ahead and start a little bit. Um, unlike, and, you know, depending, I guess, on how much stock you put in uh, different subtypes of OCD, uh, as John mentioned, it is getting some traction and talked about a little bit more in the OCD community. What seems to set real event OCD maybe somewhat apart from other more classic subtypes uh, is uh, what, what, is supposedly defines it is the presence of an actual uh, event uh, that one was a part of in some way. What we see, I think, clinically in practice is the person has uh, had some kind of event where there's a perceived wrongdoing or a mistake made, and there's the tendency to view their participation in that past event as something that has been responsible for pretty serious harm or misfortune to another person and or signifying something very personally, you know, deplorable uh, about that person's character. So there's often assumed moral implications of whatever one's role or participation was in that past event. Uh, Amy, anything you'd add to just that rough stab at the definition that I took? Yeah, that's great. I agree with that. I think that I sort of look at it as with real event OCD, which again is, is not like a separate diagnosis or anything like that. But when we're talking about this particular content area, there is this event that's occurred in the past that um, 
is usually either sort of neutral or somewhat negative in terms of there being perhaps some guilt or shame associated with it. But it's really neutral, negative, or I would say there's this kind of third subtype where it's um, there's some uncertainty about like, well, you know, I was I was drunk and then the next day blank. Right. So I think it does bleed into that that false memory subtype as well. And I'm glad to talk more about that. But whatever that event is, as you're sort of looking at your autobiographical history, there is some event that occurred. And that's kind of the seed around which the OCD content blooms and the interpretations of what this means. Um, they sort of coalesce around that. And I would say as well that um, the real event oftentimes, not always, but can be something um, that happened in your past. Like, for example, a really common one, it tends to go after taboo themes. So a really common one is sexual play in childhood, which is, you know, it's typical and normative that happens. And then years later is, is sort of reinterpreted by OCD as evidence for blank. I'm a pedophile. I'm a terrible person. I aggressed upon someone. And I think what distinguishes real event OCD as a subtype from some of the other ones is that you can have sort of evidence from things in your past for any of the, the subtypes, right? So mm -hmm. from the identity subtypes, you can be thinking, well, I, um, you know, I wonder if I was sexually attracted to, to somebody who is not in my uh, sexuality or something like that is not consistent with my sexuality. I'm looking back and thinking about that. But that's sort of like evidence for a different subtype. And I'm putting evidence, obviously, and I'm air quoting all over the place because, you know, that's OCD's interpretation. Right. But with real event OCD, this, this event itself becomes the, again, the seed for all the obsessions and compulsions to grow out of. Okay, so there's there's like one isolated thing that doesn't necessarily have to be bad that happened in the past and then kind of, is it normally like like years and years after or could it be something that happened a week ago? And that's how it starts. Yeah. I think we really see the range, uh, I, you know, temporally it can date back as far as in theory when one begins the ability to form memories to anything up to, you know, very recently, uh, days ago, weeks ago. Um, ten, I, I think though, um, prototypically what we see is the real event is something that has happened in the more distant past. Uh, it, it may have been something at the time, may have been pretty innocuous to the person, but years later, reflecting on it further, or maybe just even personal growth, one comes to reflect and recognize, hey, this thing that I did years ago didn't seem like a big deal at the time, but boy, does it ever now, given what I've learned, what I've experienced, or just new ways of thinking about this, this memory that I have. The, um, I guess the, the best example from my own work that I've kind of run into is someone who was now like in their 30s or 40s. And for them, the real event was a party that they had gone to in college and they had too much to drink and they blacked out. And, and they can't remember what happened. And maybe they took advantage of, it was a female. Maybe I, maybe I flirted too much with, with a guy um, and, and, and I was dating someone else at the time. And maybe I was, you know, maybe I did something improper. And this woman ended up marrying someone else completely. It doesn't have anything to do with any of the people there at, that were at that party, you know, 20 years ago. Um, but they still, you know, what if I cheated on my then boyfriend at this party and that was the main theme of the obsession yeah and i will say i think that's why these ideas and they seem on the surface like they would be opposed to one another but the ideas of real event ocd and false memory ocd being discrepant concepts because those i think are out in the um popular literature about about ocd um sort of in the lay community i think that there's a lot they're a lot more porous between the two of them because there you have john that was a real event that you went and got drunk mm -hmm. but then all the memories around it of what could have happened those sometimes can be so convincing as to to feel like false memories yeah so so yeah so talk a little bit about amy it's a good point talk a little bit about um that's another one that i'm not too familiar with the difference between i mean for me it's all just it's ocd Right. Yeah. I don't care what we what we, we could call it, you know, roses are red OCD. Um, but <laughs> but yeah, if we're going to have these kind of, you know, nicknames that we give them. What's the difference between real event OCD and false memory OCD? 
Go ahead, Amy. Go? <laughs> okay. I, I, so I think that the difference is sometimes often, I will say when you have one, you often have the other, but not always. So just to keep it, you know, nice and nice and clean there. Um, so real event is something I can verify it happened. It happened. I, um, you know, I was a, a as a child, I uh, played doctor with a friend. OK, I remember that happened and we were taken off our clothes. OK, that's a re real event. And then there's oftentimes not always, but there's oftentimes some fuzziness around what else happened. Did I No, maybe I did something improper. Maybe they were maybe I was older than I thought I was. So all these doubts that kind of bloom up around it can be also seen as false, false memory. Um, so I think you can have both. I, false memory is something where it's, you know, I'm not quite sure. So either, you know, I was drunk or I was, what if I was sleepwalking or something like that? That's another one we see any sort of like loss of conscious control. And during that time, I don't know what happened, but I'm getting this image in my head. And what if that's a memory? To me, that feels more like false memory. But again, they, they feel like they're very fused. And I don't know, Nick, if you kind of see it that way as well. Yeah, absolutely, Amy. Um, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head here that there's uh, the, the, the main distinction that I, I agree with you, John, at the end of the day is, is irrelevant. OCD is OCD is OCD. It's, you know, we, we, we see in both subtypes that we're talking about here uh, a tendency to have difficulty with accepting and tolerating not knowing, mm -hmm. not knowing. Sometimes it's not knowing, did this thing actually happen or not? Do I have an accurate recollection of it? Sometimes it's not so much you know, do I have an accurate recollection of it? Yes, I, I absolutely do, but I'm uncertain about the implications of it. So I remember vividly calling that kid four eyes and a loser on the school bus. That the, 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 the veracity of that memory is not in question. What I can't handle is not knowing how did it affect him? Yeah. Could I have unknowingly set him up for a lifetime of depression, anxiety, bankruptcy, all as a consequence of that nasty thing I said on the bus. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, I mean, in yeah. that case, it seems a little more clear, but in, in John, like the case you raised about the party, it's a lot less clear what the difference is. Yeah. And I well, mean, as Amy points out, I think some of these situations are kind of cloudy. You know, sometimes there's uh, an intact memory of aspects of a situation, but yeah. then uncertainty on other aspects. So I remember uh being in that economics exam and feeling an urge to look at my neighbor's exam and maybe cheat but i don't remember did i actually do it and mm -hmm. so there might be a tendency then compulsively to try to mentally review do i remember my eyes wandering over do i remember mm -hmm. that on question five you know my neighbor seemed to have circled answer c on the multiple choice exam or something of that nature yeah i mean and it seems like just you know whatever obsession the person has it's different aspects or degrees or amounts of uncertainty about events going from, you know, what if I hit someone with my car and that probably did not happen to, you know, what you're saying, I, I, I took the exam or like someone, um, I, I have gotten off, I've done a lot of these Zoom things and I don't have OCD, but I've gotten off of these and had the thought, you know, what if I said something inappropriate? What if I said a racial slur or something like that on there? And like Kyle said, it's on the internet forever. Right. I've certainly had those kinds of thoughts. So a real event. Did I actually say that? Well, so far, I don't I would bet that I haven't. But, you know, obviously, I don't have a guarantee. But it's just it's interesting, you know, phenomenologically that and I guess, you know, we all know OCD is all about this need for certainty, intolerance of uncertainty. And they're just different degrees of it. It can be about whether an event occurred at all or it can be about very specific aspects of, a, of, of an event, how someone might have interpreted something. Did I do something during an event? Um, did, were there some sort of moral, religious implications? Cool stuff. That's what I love about all this. It's just so interesting. Yeah. John, I, I leave every live stream wondering if I said something stupid. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, in your case, oh, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's a little different. Um, I wanted to ask you, Amy and Nick, um, if I'm a clinician and someone's presenting, uh, with real event OCD or false memory OCD or somewhere in between, what are kind of the compulsions that I might be on the lookout for? Like it's, it's not as clear as washing hands or something more stereotypical. 
I think like the number one compulsion that I see, and Nick, I, I'm curious to hear what you have to say, but yeah. number one compulsion is this, is mental reviewing, going over this event over and over and over again, trying to obtain clarity. And what I say about that is, and I realize that these metaphors kind of the more we go into the digital age, the less effective they are, because the two metaphors that I talk about are it's like replaying a tape over and over again and the tape gets warped, like who replays tapes now? And number yeah, two great. is, um, <laughs> <laughs> right, is um, this idea if you're using like a photocopier and you have a clear picture and you take a photocopy of it and then you run that photocopy back through and through and through in your attempts to gather clarity. I really want to remember those details. You're actually making things more fuzzy. And we know this about memory. We know this to be true, that when you're remembering something, it's then a memory of a memory, which sort of becomes um, a story we tell ourselves. So you're actually getting less, less clarity rather than more. So I would say mental reviewing for sure, um, reassurance seeking, Sometimes there's something, sometimes, well, the big ones, right? Reassurance seeking avoidance. So perhaps avoiding the place or the people with whom or around whom this event occurred. On the mm -hmm. flip side, seeking out information. So I'm going to look up, um, from Nick's example, I'm going to look up that person I called Four Eyes and I'm going to make sure they're doing okay. But you know what? Once I've like made sure they're doing okay through social media, I'm going to, that's not going to feel quite right. So those would be some of the ones um, that I primarily see. I think also another one is um, particularly with uh, presumptive harm themes and things like that, like, well, am I a bad person? Was I capable of this? You might see people almost um, reenacting that a little bit, like, could mm -hmm. I, you know, could I have strangled someone? Like, am I, am I strong enough? Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I've had some people sort of compulsively like trying that trying out their grip on their own neck and things like that. And I say that to say, if anybody's out there and has had that symptom, um, that my heart goes out to you and for to eliminate some of that shame, because I don't think we talk enough about some of those. We talk a lot about avoidance, but sometimes there's like over practicing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think uh, you've hit on some of the real big ones, Amy. What, what sticks out to me from some of the examples of compulsions that you've just described is clinically speaking, those I think we see done most often in response to difficulties with uncertainty around the implications of this real event. So I, I called someone a nasty name. I cheated years ago on my romantic partner. I cheated on an exam, um, but I, I don't know what that means about this other person who may have been affected or what it means about me. I can't handle that uncertainty. I can't live with not knowing. I have to try to seek information and find out. What I want to add is in some presentations of real event OCD, there's a tendency for there to be actually less difficulty with uncertainty, but actually more, more call it erroneous certainty that this means this about me. I'm an awful, despicable, deplorable person. I don't deserve this or that. I deserve an awful life. And so you see compulsions or safety behaviors line up with that. I need to punish myself now. I need to seek atonement in some way. If I was present in the workplace where a racist joke was made and I laughed along with the crowd rather than speaking up, and now I regret that years later, the only way I can atone is maybe to say make excessive uh, monetary, you know, donations, contributions to um, advocacy organizations or something like that. Certainly not to not to demean that, uh, but we have seen people, you know, literally go bankrupt over I I feel compelled to do this because it, it's the penance that I owe for my wrongdoing. Wow, that's incredibly interesting. Um, so then I guess there's a question in the chat, which is kind of where where my head went when Amy, you mentioned, um, what did you mention? Or I guess nothing in particular, but, oh, you mentioned like avoiding things that might trigger these thoughts. Um, so my brain went to like, okay, well, how do I know if this is PTSD or OCD um, that's fixating on something that actually happened and now I'm avoiding it because of OCD. So how do you make that distinction? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, 
certainly the the two can bleed into each other somewhat similarities you know consist of kind of fixation on memory of a certain real event you know that happened to a person i think what we see in ptsd more often than not is a person either being the victim uh of you know wrongdoing or something you know i guess outside of their control natural disasters or something like that uh or witnessing it whereas more often than not in real event ocd we see people kind of assume or perceive themselves as being in the role of a perpetrator of some kind of bad event but in other words being having personal responsibility now it, it's it's not impossible to develop post-traumatic stress disorder in the aftermath of you know being personally responsible for trauma say to someone else uh, but I, I think what we see more often when we're talking about real event ocd is a person again sort of perceiving or casting themselves in the villain role to, for lack mm -hmm. of a better term um and then also the the difficulties with accepting and living with uncertainty about the implications of that on other people as well as what it means about you know kind of my moral standing and character and, and I wonder too whether there's also some overlap with depression because mm -hmm. you know people are kind of beaten up on themselves and negative cognitions about you know themselves and the world you know things like that. I, yeah, I think that it's it, we can get into you know from an ERP perspective what some good exposures might be, but honestly from that depression perspective as well, I almost feel like behavioral activation of getting back out, getting into your life, is doing double duty as both alleviating depression. And so what we're, what we're talking about with behavioral activation is things like, um, you know, engaging in pleasurable activities, also engaging in routine activities that you might have been avoiding just due to sort of low motivation or things like that. But given how much this can uh, give rise to feelings of guilt and so forth, I think sometimes that people are, whether it's a conscious compulsion of self-punishment or something like that, they, they really have this shame that's like, well, I don't deserve to have a life. And so mm -hmm. BA or behavioral activation is doing double duty of both reducing depression, but also as an exposure to what about, can I, can I live as if I'm not the terrible person that my brain is telling me I am? And by doing so, sort of gathering evidence of like, oh, I can do this. So in some ways, um, and I realize that might be a way to sort of stretch the d definition of exposure, but from my perspective, that's exposure because that's doing something that your your OCD, depression, or combination thereof is saying is, um, you know, is wrong or is, or is not not okay to do. Is that kind of like, oh, I don't deserve um, X, Y, or Z? Is that mm, something that's common to other OCD subtypes? I don't hear that as often being a cognition. I think so. I mean, I've seen it for a lot of the a lot of the harm ones, a lot of the taboo ones. That's where I see it. And oftentimes, if as if I'm doing therapy or I'm supervising somebody who's doing therapy with people who have taboo themes, if there's that thick kind of overlay of shame and you're kind of chipping away at that, um, I think prior to jumping into things like exposure, particularly if people are very fused to this idea, I am a bad person, I did do a bad thing, like Nick said, this um, overconfidence, this, this sort of erroneous certainty that the bad thing happened and I'm a bad person, then sometimes doing a little bit of chipping away at that with some self-compassion work prior to just jumping in can be really, really helpful. But I've seen it across, across subtypes. I think it's just perhaps maybe a little bit more in this one. Agree, Amy, and I would add uh, scrupulosity uh, to the to the short list that you started. We must also acknowledge that other so-called OCD subtypes aren't without real events as precipitants. Right. Uh, you know, uh, working with someone, say, with maybe a more classic, straightforward contamination OCD, I find more often than not there are at least one, if not multiple, real events in that person's life that seem to have played some kind of role in the origins of the condition. And so I, I don't know that we're talking about something that is is categorically different from you know the the beast that we know OCD to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the more that uh, it makes a lot of sense, the more that I think about it, it's not like you have contamination OCD and harm OCD and scrupulosity and real event OCD. Right. It's more that all of those because you're right, it seems like a lot, you know, even for folks that have contamination, like I, I did flush the toilet, right? I was in the bathroom. That was a real event. Now I'm worried about the germs later on, which I guess was one of the things like, again, when when folks mentioned it to me, I kind of 
like, well, what do you mean? Most uh, OCD comes from there's some sort of little kernel of like, you know, something happened that made you have these kinds of obsessions. Something triggered the obsession. Something in 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 real life. Um, yeah, I I'm wondering, you know, any thoughts about like why why did this um, this subtype kind of break apart? Why do you any any sense of the origin of where this came from? Why do we feel like we need to have this labeling of you know uh, yet another type of OCD? <laughs> That's a fascinating question, John. Um, my my best sense is, you know, the, like you described earlier, there there is a little bit of popular literature. Unfortunately, by comparison, not as much empirical literature that we can rely on right now about real event OCD. Um, but I'm guessing, you know, that story you told us about the person that made their way to your clinic and said, "Hey, I've got real event OCD." Um, my sense is literature has been put out there to try to help sufferers in the OCD community kind of feel like they have a place, mm -hmm. um, whereas the literature may have been somewhat dominated by subtypes or common features that have just sort of been around a lot longer, talked about more, uh, contamination, harm, you know, religiosity. These are things that come to mind. And not to say, you know, real event OCD and, you know, phenomena associated with it if it just been discovered in the last 10 years. It's certainly not the case, um, but just kind of trying to give um, people that may be struggling with these tendencies, uh, a sort of home to understand, hey, there, there, there is a recognition of what you're experiencing and other people experience it as well. And most importantly, we, we think we have a good idea of how to help you overcome it. So maybe just kind of helping folks to identify with what's happening for them um, and, and give it some sort of name, uh, yeah. I think it's a real, because a lot of people with real event OCD will come in and say, well, this doesn't feel like OCD because it really happened. Yeah. I think it was sort of like born of that need to say, okay, well, if it really happened, like let's let's call it real event OCD then. It can yeah. still be, be OCD. And again, I think the lack of, the lack of empirical literature on it um, doesn't, to me, doesn't, negate the importance of having that. And then nobody's saying this, but it doesn't negate the importance of having those terms out there so that sufferers can see it and say like, oh, I see myself in this example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering, um, so like uh, as someone with OCD, I've dealt with contamination fears mostly. And I've always thought like when I'm washing my hands excessively, like this isn't excessive. I need to protect myself by washing seven times. Um, and my parents are the ones who like first pointed out, no, that's excessive. So um, any like tips for someone who may be dealing with real event OCD on how to figure out like, am I experiencing reasonable or excessive shame and guilt from this thing mm -hmm. that really did happen? That's, that's an awesome question. If, if we make a distinction for a moment between guilt and shame, where shame being the more, I guess, sort of personally or characterologically relevant thing versus guilt may be unique to a specific action. Clinically speaking, I think we would try to guide a person in recognizing that some reasonable degree of guilt following, you know, pretty um, categorically wrong actions may be helpful, again, at, at, at reasonable levels. Uh, right. if, if we feel guilt over clear wrongdoing that we have inflicted, that can be a good sense, you know, a, a, I guess a good opportunity for us to go, well, I, I, I don't like how I'm feeling. Uh, I, I don't wanna do this again. So put in future situations, I may make different choices. Mm -hmm. I think that's different from, Amy was describing more of a shame-based um, mentality, if you will, around a, a past real event or past real events that this now means something, you know, kind of characterologically about me that is um, unmalleable. I, I am this way forever. And these are the consequences that I'm due. There's, I think, a kind of a distinction that we can make there clinically. Are we looking at this real event as a unique action that just is to be treated as a unique action and nothing more? Uh, or something that is indicative of, you know, some kind of characterological flaw that, that can't be changed or, or modified somehow. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage people to, you know, seek out an, uh, somebody who specializes in OCD. And um, if, it, if it feels like, well, I'm not sure, then sort of go and 
that's the first exposure is disclosing for many people disclosing the real event is the first exposure because you're sort of opening yourself up to wow what if my belief that i'm a really bad person is, is substantiated in some way or is um verified by this other person so i think going to somebody who specializes in in ocd taking that risk of kind of saying like this is this is what happened i'm really not sure i know i i can imagine how difficult that is and then I think Nick brings up a really good point, which is that there's um, it's guilt is a helpful adaptive emotion. And so sometimes with people, I will even go through and use things from different modalities like DBT has a check the facts exercise where it's kind of like if you're experiencing this emotion, check the facts to see, you know, is this something for which guilt is appropriate or might this be a distortion? If it's a distortion, we can proceed. Um, so. But within the context of OCD, I'll say like when this comes up, um, being able to say, being able to disclose it and have somebody say, okay, are you willing to treat this like OCD? Because, you know, I see this as part of OCD. That's a huge first step. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I guess <laughs> my natural question is like, how do you convince someone that this should be treated as OCD and this is something more than just, you know, adaptive guilt. Slowly. Slowly <laughs> <laughs> and slowly. A million dollar question, right? Yeah. I think Kyle, a, a telltale thing that we're on the lookout for is when it becomes pretty apparent that the person's difficulty with accepting and tolerating, you know, this bad action uh, that I was responsible for, accepting and tolerating what you know, effects that might have had on the other person or people, and also what it means about me really start to interfere with one's ability to function and, and do life how they want to. Um, it may also be responsible for, you know, significant just emotional distress. So a person may, you know, be able to kind of hold it all together, function, go to work, uh, you know, participate in family life, social events, etc. cetera. Um, and yet they're, quality of life is greatly diminished because you know, the, the, they're consistently spending time ruminating on this. You know, wh what I did, what, what you know, damage I could have inflicted, and also what, what does this mean about me as a person and say about me going forward? Mm -hmm. Maybe you're saying that. <laughs> Give me yeah, space. no, I, I think like it's the, it's that classic pattern of, of attempts to come to a resolution that drive you farther away from resolution. That to me is often something that I point out, like you would have figured you are bright. You have spent so much time thinking about this. You know, if there were a resolution, I really think that you would have gotten there. So yeah. are you willing to, with the, to use some act language, with the current unworkability of this of how you've been approaching this, are you willing to try something different and to sometimes, you know, let go of some of this, some of the narrative that you've built around this? And um, I know that feels risky. It's not going to feel like you can 100% trust it. That's the deal is it wants you to 100% trust it one way or the other. Mm -hmm. But are you willing to trust that? Be compassionate to yourself and try some different things. Yeah, so I, I kind of want to get into what treatment would look like for this because like like we've been saying kind of for a while like with contamination ocd is more straightforward i just have to stop washing my hands but this is a little bit more complex and john i wanted to turn to you you uh didn't know too much about real event ocd and were presented with clients who had it um so what was your first thought with okay how do i approach exposure therapy well i don't think there's much of a difference um i think you know what what treatment for OCD needs to do is help people to um, learn new information. And that information, what it usually boils down to are three things. One is, you know, the, the situation that I'm afraid of is not as dangerous as I think. It doesn't mean it's 0% uh, dangerous or 100% safe because there's no such thing as that. Um, but let's learn how to, you know, it's not 50-50 that something bad, you know, is, is going to happen. So that's one thing that you know, treatment needs to do. Uh, the next thing it needs to help people to be uh, kind of like what Amy was saying, how uh, be better at their unwanted thoughts, their doubts, their uncertainty, 
um, and, and how to be able to lean into those experiences and um, accept them because we really don't have an alternative. Um, and so how to be how to be open to those experiences rather than fighting them all the time. And then third is leaning into anxiety and learning that anxiety is safe and normal and it's manageable and it sucks to feel a lot of anxiety, but uh, it turns out that the more we try to fight it, the worse, you know, so the worse it gets. So exposure therapy act, I think, you know, those have um, those goals of, of teaching people that, that new information. And I don't, to me, the, the type of OCD and really the, the large, largely the type of anxiety, you know, presentation is not really that important. If I use the tools that I have as a cognitive behavioral therapist and thinker, um, I can figure out what do I need to do to help the person I'm working with to learn that new information in a way that's going to, you know, help them to not be afraid of situations, thoughts and feelings, private experiences, stuff like that. I don't know. I said a lot. Let's see what our panelists think. I think there's something to be said as well for psychoeducation about memory and OCD. So while oh, we yeah. don't have yeah. a lot, we don't have a lot of, well, we don't really have much research at all empirically about real event OCD. We do know that people with OCD may have very, very small, you know, differences in working memory potentially. But when you're looking at memory kind of writ large, so things like accuracy, autobiographical memory, things like that, there are really no differences. Vividness of memory, there are no differences between people with OCD and people uh, without OCD. In fact, where you see that there is a difference is in this idea of confidence in one's memory, yeah. right? So I think that's a really important thing to, to bring up and to just kind of say memory confidence and not memory ability is really where people with OCD struggle. And um, providing that psychoeducation, providing the education that OCD is gonna attack things that are important to you. Um, education from a cognitive level as well, things like um, in ICBT, they talk somewhat about selectivity of doubts. So you're having these doubts about these events years later, but there are all these other events in your life that are you know, neutral or similar or mildly negative and your OCD hasn't latched on there. So I think there's some cognitive ways as well to just kind of break things up a little bit and say, um, you know, this is, this is not a, uh, a, a memory deficit, but it is, a lack of confidence in memory, how can we build that confidence back up with cognitive strategies, with behavioral strategies, with proving it to yourself in ways that can feel really empowering, even if they're scary at the time? That's kind of how I see exposure is like, it's it's a way to kind of get in there and again, not attain the certainty that you might be, be craving, but to show yourself, wow, this is really empowering. I can do things that are meaningful, even when even when there's still a sliver of a doubt. Mm -hmm. Folk, folks with OCD are, are really smart. And and they, no, it, John. And they <laughs> except <laughs> well, present company included. Um, and and they recognize that, like what you were talking about before, Amy, they, people with OCD, they recognize that memories are not like, like a video recording of, a, of an event. They recognize that there's bias uh, there and that we, we um, that we don't have, that our memories are not perfect. And absolutely, yeah, ed educating them and helping them to understand that's not just because of OCD. Ed, we're all in that same boat. Um, and and the difference, again, is I think that most folks are open to that. Well, it doesn't seem like I cursed to everybody on the on the thing today, so I probably am, am okay. Um, whereas a person with OCD, they need to have that guarantee 100% 101% ironclad. I've got to know that I didn't. So I'm going to watch the, the YouTube clip of it over and over again to make sure that I didn't say anything wrong. So what are, to make it a little more concrete, like what are some exposures or kind of strategies that you could use in a session if I were a therapist dealing with a client? Generally speaking, Kyle, uh, the exposure work that we have done around real event OCD um, involves just you know confronting whatever the situation or stimulus is that kind of shines a light on one's uncertainty around the real event and is that talking it through or writing it down or it might be yeah. uh it might be visiting 
places or people or engaging in activities that remind one of whatever participation or role that they had in that prior event. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a practical example, and I also want to use the practical example to uh, suggest something that was in addition to the good points that Amy and John made about treatment and really kind of it being um, no, no different than how we know ERP to apply. Mm -hmm. But I was, work I was working with someone uh, within the last year. This is someone who um, during high school uh, was a recreational drug user and happened to introduce several friends to recreational drugs. Uh, person kind of went on with their life, maybe six, seven, eight years down the road, came back uh, to visit uh, the hometown, ran into a mother of one of their friends at the grocery store and learned that one of these friends was about to check into their third stint in a substance abuse rehab clinic. This was the impetus for the development of, you know, what we <laughs> call today real event OCD. There was difficulties with uncertainty. There was a very pronounced need to know, was I responsible for this? Mm -hmm. Was my, you know, role in introducing this person to recreational drugs, the thing, or even a partial contributor to this person, you know, struggling with addiction and substance use problems? Because there was an assumption uh, of, I, I did play a part in that, there was a perceived need for atonement. Even considering like, do I, what, what can I do? Do I reach out? Do I offer to pay you know, for, for some of this person's treatment? So exposure, a lot of times in sessions, was just being cognizant that this happened. Um, in, in a sense, it looked somewhat similar, though of course not identical, to what imaginal exposure might look like when applied to someone with post-traumatic stress disorder, which in a nutshell is reliving or revisiting the situation in your memory. So we, we had this person do that and acknowledge their doubt and uncertainty over whether I could have played you know, a, a partial or full role in this person's struggle with, with addiction. The key came in, Kyle, was with the response prevention strategies. And based on what I'm told you, I'm, I'm sure you understand we had to encourage this person to cease all of the efforts they were making to try to arrive at some, you know, sense of certainty and a conclusion about what was I responsible or was I not, or how much responsibility did I have? Mm -hmm. I love that example, Nick. And I feel like there's a, um, and again, it's going to be, this is what's really tough is it, it depends, right? Like it always depends on, on, on what the, in terms of exposures, I always look at where is the avoidance and that includes cognitive avoidance as well. Mm. So whereas you have some people who are unwilling to go back and think about this event or they kind of, I always, I, I use the word nope as a verb and I'm like, they just nope on out of that. That thought comes up and they're <laughs> noping over here, noping over there. They're dancing ah, around. I, I don't like want to think about it. Or, are they doing the opposite where the compulsion itself is dragging themselves back through it and dragging themselves back through it, et cetera. So I'm thinking of an example of a woman I worked with who has a son, this was years ago. And when her son was an infant, she was walking and it was icy and she slipped and she fell with the baby. And the baby, they went to a, um, you know, they got the child checked out right away. No issues, no medical issues, forgot about it. And then years later, when this child was a young adult and started having some like ADHD type symptoms, her OCD convinced her, I caused that with that fall. That single event was the catalyst for my son's issues. And furthermore, on the basis of that, I am a negligent mother, which was her worst fear. And she was raking herself over the coals, thinking about this over and over and over again. So in that case, the exposure was not to go back and think about, you know, that event because she was already doing that a ton, right? Functionally for her, it was, she was getting ready to get her son, you know, to go to a neurologist. Let's get a, um, let's get some brain scans, make sure that there wasn't permanent damage, that kind of stuff. So we leaned into that as response prevention and um, leaned into the idea of, I'm accepting that, you know, my son has these attention issues and I don't need to know exactly why. And maybe I can't know why. And I think that's true that she can't know why. Right. I think a lot of times with as with a lot of OCD queries, there isn't an answer. It's not like, well, let's search harder and we'll find it. Yeah. And that's then just. Point, to, oh, sorry, 
Uh, no, I was going to just add then the um, what we want to do with that uncertainty is to um, to operate with it. Uh, a lot of times people will say, you know, you got to bring on the uncertainty and we got to sit with the uncertainty. And and I tell people, no, 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 we're not sitting with anything. We're acting. We're we're operating. You're we're going to school. We're going to work. We're hanging out with friends and taking out your little you know card where it says I might have done, you know, X, Y and Z while you're hanging out with people and learning, I can have these thoughts. I can have the uncertainty. I can have that distress. And that doesn't have to bully me into missing out on important, you know, activities. I'm throwing a, a lot of act stuff in with my work these days. Yeah. That was an interesting exposure idea, John. <laughs> Having a little college. <laughs> have you guys ever done that? I do that all the time. I have Absolutely. folks. Yeah. I mean, I want people, I, Therapy is, you know, if, if, you know, I meet with folks once a week and, and if that's the extent of the therapy that they're doing, that's not enough. They need to be practicing, you know, as much as possible. So we usually, if we're doing an imaginal exposure, we're going to write down the gist of it on a, a note card. They're going to put it in their pocket off. They go to school or work or what, you know, whatever they're going to do. And I want them to have some sort of reminder of what they're uncertain about so that they can learn I can work, I can read, I can go to a ball game, I can do whatever, go to school, even though I don't know for sure whether I did X, Y, or Z, or whether I'm going to heaven or hell, or whether, because the truth is we, we all, whether you have OCD or not, like there's, uh, you know, I can't think of too many things that you have any guarantee of, right? I can have a heart attack by the end of the day. It's not likely, I wouldn't bet against it. I'm sorry, I would bet against it. But it could happen, and I have to. I have to live with that. I got to do this. I have a master's thesis committee that I'm on later on. I got to live with that uncertainty. And we want people to learn how to be able to do that, whether the event was something that was part of a real event or whether it was a completely imagined event. That's such a great point, John. I, I, you know, if there's a tweak or any kind of modification to an exposure like that, when we apply it to real event OCD, the little card, a reminder that the person would carry might acknowledge, you know, the realness of the event. I I introduced so-and-so to recreational drugs in high school. We we would encourage the exposure to uncertainty over, and I don't know what role that might have played yeah. in, in in their development of addiction. Yeah. You know, I I called so-and-so four eyes and a loser on the bus. I, I I don't know what happened. I don't know what what fallout that may have been responsible for. Yeah. yeah. I love the um you all, I don't know if it's for Android as well, but Y'all might have heard of the app Yap, where you can on iPhone. Yeah, you can get this app and you can put in a number of different statements or things like that. And then you can choose how many times a day the individual will get just it's almost like a text message, but it will come up and it will say something like, you, you know, you exactly you call that person four eyes or like you can't be sure. Or sometimes they're just more general, like maybe or things like that. And, um, and it randomizes it, which again, from like an act perspective yeah. is, is really cool and has it more integrated into your life. I tell people, I want that. I want your experience of uncertainty to feel so empowering that you recognize, Hey, this is not like, this is no different than any other uncertainty. This not knowing for sure is actually a part of the human condition. And it's so painful because it's something that is, it represents what I don't want to be. And it's challenging what I do want to be. And it's challenging my values. So if I can fly in the face of that uncertainty, now, of course, if they're very fused, I'm going to help them reduce that uncertainty a little bit by giving, you know, psychoeducational information. If it's been things like, um, childhood sexual play, I'm going to say, okay, well, here's, here's, that's normative. Right. Um, I'm not going to say that every session <laughs> because that would then be sort of excessive reassurance, right? There's sort of assurance in education and then there's reassurance and excessiveness, um, which can be compulsive. So yeah, that's kind of my take. I'm so glad you brought up the randomness, Amy, that Yap and other similar apps can help us kind of inject uh, into exposure therapy. Um, I, I don't know about you both, but uh, one trend I seem to have noticed over the last 10 years or so in doing this work is there's there's greater tendency for clients to tell me or to tell the therapist that I supervise when the exposure is predictable, yeah. when I know what's coming, it's not a very close approximation of the real experience. Yeah. And so what, what ways can we try to best simulate, you know, the randomness, right? The unpredictability of when 
that obsession or just when that recognition of a real event that I played some hand in comes to mind. And that's very consistent with inhibitory learning perspectives on exposure therapy, right? The way that we learn has a lot to do with how well we're going to maintain that learning later on. And it turns out that when we learn stuff, when we're surprised and it's more random, we actually learn better. There's a different context there. Um, but I, wow, I love that. I am definitely, somebody wrote in there that it's Y A Y A P P remind Yap reminders. Yep, two P's yeah. on the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, I am definitely getting that. I love that. See, I learned some. This is awesome. <laughs> it's, it's always like interesting being on a panel with a bunch of clinical psychologists because, like Amy, when you brought up that app, John and Nick were both like, "That's awesome," and in my head, I was like, "Oh God, that sounds awful." <laughs> like, oh, my head, oh my gosh. <laughs> so I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up because in the inhibitory learning world, we call that a desirable difficulty, right? Mm -hmm. We want to make exposure, and sorry folks that are going through exposure, we want to make exposure more challenging because that's going to make it work better. The more you challenge yourself when you're doing the exposures by doing things randomly, for example, right? Um, that we call those desirable difficulties. They suck in the in the here and now, but in the long run, they're they're desirable. Um, so you 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 want a therapist that's going to challenge you, not force you, of course, but to challenge you to do those things. And you might start with doing more predictable exposures, and then work your way up to uh, doing it in a more random way. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I, I also wanted to get all your perspective um, before we run out of time here about maybe how uh, the research community community can approach real event OCD or if there are topics specific to real event OCD that are, are deserving of some research. I feel so far removed from the research community at this point, but I can, as, as a, you know, primarily a clinical person, I can take a stab at this. Um, I mean, I, I think that I think there's something fruitful in these ideas about, um, as Nick was saying, the ideas about these cognitive, um, these common cognitive factors of um, potentially over responsibility or um, the other ones that tend to happen with moral scrupulosity. So something's happened. It's my fault. I'm a bad person. Those kind of schemas or, or beliefs about oneself. Um, I think there would be something fruitful there. I think that um, I certainly think that clinical research, in terms of um, just you know having, we know clinically and we sort of know theoretically, given that it follows the same trajectory as other OCD. I think we know that um, the treatments that work for OCD also work for real event OCD. However, you know having some of that um, having some of that those data would probably be helpful but i would be really interested in some of the cognitive components here and how those kind of are mitigated or or lessened throughout treatment as you're going through and doing more exposure so how do some of these self beliefs and maybe even in a more globalized sense you know does self compassion um, does that change over time? Given that, along with a lot of these other taboo themes, um, it's really going for the jugular. I think that would be really cool to see, yeah, if that's changing in tandem with people going through treatment. That's such a good point, Amy. And maybe we've got a, an idea cooking here for a study around, is it, you know, one thing that I would say anecdotally, I've found to be needed at times in, in treating folks with real event OCD is what I'd call some light cognitive therapy. Not traditional cognitive therapy in the sense that we guide a client in recognizing how they're thinking wrong and how they need to think right or how their thoughts are inaccurate and they need to think more accurately. It's I think about flexibility. So the client that I introduced earlier had a very rigid idea around if I never would have introduced that person to recreational drugs in high school, they would never be where they are in their lives right now. And I, I couldn't tell that person they're wrong so what, what we aim for is rather than you're thinking inaccurately about this and you need to think more accurately, it was a, you seem to be pretty inflexible having formed this conclusion. How can we think about this more flexibly? Might there be alternative you know, things to consider here? And I, I think that's so important because that, that shifts one towards uncertainty. We can put some you know, potential alternatives on the table, but not, not jump to a conclusion. 
These are all possibilities. We now live with not knowing. So that, that's one way I think that, you know, some light cognitive therapy techniques can actually augment our exposure work. Uh, John or Amy and, and Nick, I've, this has been the most enthralling um, live stream I've done so far. Uh, do you guys have any party? He words? says that every time. No, <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't. <laughs> we've had some more. We've had some that are, we've had variability. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, do you guys have any any parting comments? Things you want people to take away or know? Amy and Nick. I'll just reiterate, you know, I think something that John said earlier that, you know, when we talk about this as a subtype and Amy made this point, it, it's, we don't think phenomenologically distinct from other, other, you know, so-called subtypes of OCD. So I, I don't think we've invented or identified a new condition per se, um, just maybe a somewhat unique presentation. And the goal is if folks are out there struggling with this problem to, you know, help them feel as though they, they have a voice and a place and an understanding of this now. Yeah, I would say if there's anybody out there, again, who is listening to this and it's resonating, but you're nervous about, but what is it? But what, you know, should I seek treatment? I mean, talk talk about this. I think that's the, what I would say, um, talk about it with your therapist or find a therapist or heck, I mean, even reach out to, to me. <laughs> I might regret that. But, um, but yeah, just, you know, I, I think because of the shame, the more it's living in, in shame, you know, the less you're going to have an opportunity to challenge some of those beliefs about the meaning of this event. So my, my, my heart is with you. <laughs> what Amy yeah. and, Nicola, and, and Nick said, I would, I would completely agree. Yeah, well, thank you both. Um, this has been super interesting, as I just said, and, and I think it's going to help a lot of people and a, a lot of people resonate with this. And given just the lack of information out there about Real Event OCD, I think this is a really valuable resource. Um, this, this live stream is one of many, just a plug. You can see the entire schedule of future live streams at iocdf.org slash peace of mind. Um, there's a ton and they're all great. So you should check them out. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So thank you, Nick. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, John, as always. Um, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Thank you, everybody.